There are some names in psychology that gain almost mythological status, and the subject of today's video is one of them. Today I want to tell you about the story of Phineas Gage, the man who accidentally lobotomized himself. But if you've heard of Phineas Gage's story before, you might have heard a version that is rather inaccurate. And that's because over the years, Phineas Gage's story has been retold so many different times and the details of the story have become grossly exaggerated and misrepresented by many different people. So for this video, I've done my research and I'm gonna try and tell you the most accurate version of Phineas Gage's story. Let's jump into it. Gage was born in New Hampshire in the United States in the early 1800s. Not much is known about his childhood, but we do know that according to a physician who knew him, he was, quote, perfectly healthy, strong, active young man, 25 years of age, of a nervobilious temperament. And if you don't know what nervobilious means, that's because it was a pseudoscientific term used in the early 1800s that meant energy and strength of mind and body making possible the endurance of great mental and physical labor. Which is great because physical labor is what Gage ended up doing. Gage became something known as a blasting foreman. What is a blasting foreman, I hear you ask? Well, to be a blasting foreman means you're in charge of a team of guys whose job it is, is to blow up big rocks in order to clear the way for railroad construction. And the way that they would do this is by drilling a big hole in the rock that they want to blow up, filling it with explosives and sand, then tamping that down with a long iron rod called a tamping iron, before stepping back and setting a fuse and blowing it up. I imagine it's a pretty difficult job to get health insurance for. But despite that, Gage apparently was amazing at his job. According to one of his former employers, he said of Gage, he is the most efficient and capable foreman, a shrewd and smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. So great for Gage, he's awesome at his job. But here's where the story gets juicy or should I say, gory. Because one day while Gage was working at his job, things went terribly wrong. It happened on September 13th, 1848. Gage was working on the Burlington and Rutland Railroad outside of Vermont, and as he'd done many times before, he drilled a hole in the big rock and filled it with gunpowder. But on this fateful day, for some reason after he drilled his hole and put the explosives in, he got distracted by what his employees were doing over his shoulder. So he turned around to talk to them, and as he did so, he leant his head over the hole where the rod was with the explosives, and at that very moment, as he was about to speak, the rod struck the rock, caused a spark, and lit the explosives. This resulted in the rod flying out of the hole in the rock like a rifle, going through his cheek, possibly fracturing his left cheekbone, passing behind his left eyeball, through his brain, and then out of the frontal lobe. In fact, it's said that the rod was launched from the rock with so much force that after passing through Gage's head, it landed 25 meters away from him, covered in his blood and brains. Now that's a pretty tragic thing to happen to anyone's brain, but if you want to improve your brain, then you should consider learning a language with the sponsor of today's video, Live XP. Learning a new language, it turns out, is a great brain workout because language is one of the most complex things we do with our brain from a cognitive point of view. But like any kind of workout, it's much easier to be consistent and make progress if you have a coach, which is why people love learning languages with Live XP. Unlike other language learning platforms that you might have heard of before, Live XP pairs you up with a real life tutor. Through their platform, you can do video calls with a real tutor, take notes directly on their app, and you'll also get access to their in-app word trainer, which uses a spaced repetition algorithm in order to improve recall of new vocabulary. Live XP offers tutorship in 30 plus different languages, including English, Chinese, and Spanish. And one of the best things about Live XP is that if you don't like the first tutor that you get, you can switch. You're allowed to switch anytime until you find one that you like. Live XP have a 4.1 Trustpilot score, a 4.7 Google Play App Store score, and a 4.7 Apple App Store score as well. People love Live XP and so might you. So if you're interested in learning a new language for your brain, for work, or just for fun, then be sure to check out Live XP using my code in the description. If you use code by Pete Judo, you can get your first lesson for just 99 cents. Or if you're ready to subscribe fully, you can use buy Pete Judo 30 and you'll get 30% off your entire subscription. Thank you Live XP for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to talking about the aftermath of Phineas Gage's injury. Now if I was to tell you that someone had a meter long iron rod shoot through their head, through their brain and out of the top of their skull, you would assume that they were dead. 
right? But that's why this story is so legendary in psychology. Gage lived. In fact, apparently to those there at the scene, within a few minutes, he was talking and with a little bit of assistance was able to walk to his ox cart. He got into his ox cart and started riding back to his hotel and apparently on the way back to the hotel, he even took the time to fill out his time book, the thing that logged his hours in order to bill his employer correctly. My guy has a rod shoot straight through his brain and he's still clocking out of his shift. I mean, fair play. About 30 minutes after the accident, Dr. Edward Williams arrives at Gage's hotel. He finds Gage sat on a chair outside the hotel and Gage greeted him with the most casual statement ever. Doctor, here's business enough for you. Here's work enough for you, doctor. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, you gotta love Phineas Gage. He's just like, so cool. This is what Dr. Williams wrote about this first encounter. And I'm gonna try to read it in my most uh, transatlantic, old timey voice. The top of the head appeared somewhat like an inverted funnel as if some wedge-shaped body had passed from below upward. Mr. Gage, during the time I was examining this wound, was relating the manner in which he was injured to the bystanders. I did not believe Mr. Gage's statement at that time, but thought he was deceived. However, Mr. Gage persisted in saying that the bar went through his head. Then, Mr. G got up and vomited. The effort of vomiting pressed out about a half a teacup full of the brain through the exit hole at the top of the skull, which fell upon the floor. Pretty gross. A few hours later, another doctor arrived, Dr. Harlow, and together with Williams, they treated Gage. This involved removing coagulated blood, small bone fragments, and quote, an ounce or more of protruding brain. Blech. <laughs> So, after getting stitched up by the doctors, Gage begins his recovery, but it's not a smooth road. Apparently, he would drift in and out of coma. At times, he was only able to answer questions in monosyllables. And there was the issue of infections of the wound in his head, which apparently caused him to be really stinky. Fetid was the word used by Dr. Harlow to describe the absolute stench that was emanating from Gage's head. Gage's friends and family, I think understandably, were expecting him to die at any moment. In fact, during this initial recovery period, they actually prepared for him funeral clothes and even a coffin. But despite all of this, Gage began to recover. In fact, Harlow, who ended up supervising Gage's recovery, wrote that, after 24 days, Gage was able to raise himself up. A month after that, he was able to move up and down stairs. And just 10 weeks after the injury in November, Gage went back to his parents' house in New Hampshire. A few months later in February, Gage was able to help his parents out on the farm, including feed the cattle. Later that year, Gage became somewhat of a celebrity, or at least a medical curiosity. A professor from Harvard brought him to Boston to be presented in front of the medical society there. Then after that, he became a kind of living museum exhibit at Barnum's American Museum in New York. Yep, that Barnum, the Hugh Jackman Barnum. P.T. Barnum. At your service. I am putting together a show, and I need a star. Though I should say that despite his association with Barnum, there's no evidence that Phineas Gage was ever in P.T. Barnum's circus, just that he did some paid appearances at Barnum's museum. And then it seems like Gage tried to make himself somewhat of a local celebrity. He would organize public appearances all over New England, but apparently the interest from the public and the turnout of these events was a lot lower than he expected, and so he had to go back to finding normal employment. Unfortunately, he was unable to reclaim his old job back of being a blasting foreman, and we'll talk about why that was the case later, and he spent eight years of his life working in Chile as a stagecoach driver. But after holding that job down for eight years, he began to develop seizures. Seizures that would eventually lead to him losing that job in Chile, and as the seizures were becoming more frequent and more severe, he decided to go back to his mother, who at this time was living in California. But just three days after making it back to his mother, the seizures came back again, and this time, it was fatal, and Phineas Gage died. After he died, his skull was given to Harlow, who was not only the doctor who looked after Phineas Gage, but also at this point was a very well-known and respected doctor. Also given to Harlow was Gage's tamping iron, the very one that went through his brain, which apparently Gage would carry around with him wherever he went after the accident. Later on, Harlow donated Gage's skull and his tamping iron to the Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard Medical School, where they're still on display to this very day. So why do psychologists care so much about Phineas Gage? Well, you see, at the time of Phineas Gage's accident, there was a big debate going on in the world of psychology. The debate was around whether the brain was specialized 
or not. What I mean by specialized is, does the brain have different parts that do different things? or is all of the brain responsible for everything? These days, most people know that the brain, for the most part, is specialized. Different parts do different things. But at that time, this was a big debate. And the thing about Phineas Gage was that he was a natural experiment, n equals one, which can never be replicated in real life at least not ethically. So what ended up happening is that Gage's story got twisted and exaggerated by both sides of this debate in order to support their narrative. For the people who believe that the brain wasn't specialized and that all of the brain did everything, they argued that, well, since Phineas Gage had a big chunk of his brain taken out by this iron rod and was still able to make a pretty good recovery, then that shows that the brain isn't specialized because if it took out some specialized part of the brain, then surely he'd be missing some sort of key function that wouldn't enable him to have such a good recovery. But on the other side, the specialists, who, by the way, at this point in history, are mostly comprised of phrenologists. And if you don't know, phrenology is an incredibly racist, pseudoscientific off-branch of psychology, but those are mostly the people advocating for the idea of specialism. And what the specialists slash phrenologists argued was that the part of his brain that was taken out by the tamping iron was his, quote, organ of benevolence. And the evidence for this was that some people who knew Gage claimed that after the accident, he became a lot more rude. Here's a quote from one of his former employers. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. And that seems to be why he couldn't get his old job back as a foreman. He suffered a kind of social impairment after the injury. However, in trying to push their specialism agenda and their racist phrenology agenda, the specialists exaggerated Gage's story to the point where there are many accounts of the story that perhaps you have heard in the past that say that Gage turned into some kind of horrible monster of a man after his accident, that he became like so incredibly rude that he wouldn't be able to take part in you know normal society ever again. I'm like an animal now. An animal's emotions in a man's body. But that's why I wanted to tell you what happened to Gage after his accident, because demonstrably, that wasn't the case. Gage held down and worked a solid job as a stagecoach driver in Chile for eight years, a job that requires some social skills and some you know, cognitive presence of mind. So clearly any kind of social impairment that may have been present immediately after the accident wasn't one that persisted. So it turns out both sides of the argument were wrong. The racist phrenologists were slightly less wrong, but not because phrenology is correct, it certainly is not correct, but because their idea that the brain is specialized is correct. And they were correct in saying that the part of the brain that was damaged is the part of the brain that isn't responsible for those functions that are essential for keeping us alive in day-to-day -day life. So what about today? What do we know about Gage's accident using the modern techniques of modern psychological science? Well, through software, scientists have been able to model Gage's accident using his skull in the museum and the tamping iron. And what they discovered through their modeling is that the part of the brain that was damaged by the tamping iron was the left frontal lobe. And that's the part of the brain that we tend to associate with higher functions, things like planning, working memory, and decision-making. While the parts of the brain that are needed for immediate survival, the things that are in charge of things like breathing and keeping your heart pumping, those things are located more towards the center and the base of the brain, and those parts of the brain were completely untouched by the accident. Modern modeling of the accident has also revealed that it's quite likely that Gage mostly lost white matter rather than gray matter in the brain. What are white matter and gray matter? Well, white matter and gray matter are what your brain is made of, and they differ in terms of what constitutes them. You see, your brain, and this is an oversimplification, consists of neurons, a lot of neurons. And this is what neurons look like. They're really weird cells. They're weird because they're so long. In fact, this diagram is shorter than what ne most neurons look like. Most neurons are normally way longer than this. And if you look at this diagram, you can see that neurons have kind of two sections to them. They have the main cell body part with the pink oval, and then they have the long axon, the part that's coated in the myelin sheath. And the differentiation between these two things is important because you can lose axons and axons can regrow, but if you lose the cell body, the part with the pink oval, that part will never regrow. And so when it comes to white matter and gray matter, white 
white matter is the part of the brain that mostly contains the axons, the parts that can regrow, whereas gray matter is the part that contains all of the cell bodies, the parts that don't regrow. So it makes sense that he recovered from any kind of social impairment that happened immediately after the accident, as most of the brain tissue that he lost was stuff that could grow back. And so that's how he was able to hold down his job as a stagecoach driver in Chile for eight years. So from my research, that's the most accurate version of Phineas Gage's story. I hope you enjoyed it. Tell me in the comments below if I should make a video on phrenology because that was a crazy time in psychology and maybe it's interesting for you guys if you're into these sort of crazy things that used to happen in psychology. All right, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.